So I know I haven't talked a lot about coding on this channel yet. Um, I've maybe men mentioned it kind of incidentally talking about some other little robotics projects or something. But I do want to do one quick episode on one of my favorite programming languages. And that language is Lisp. So there's probably two kinds of people watching this video. People that know about Lisp, maybe you did lit some Lisp in school because they um, were introduced to it in some type of computer language class. There's another type of person that has never heard about Lisp or never really looked at Lisp's code or never tried to code in it, probably because you're younger, but also because Curiously, I'm noticing that kind of in these comparisons of computer languages now, even like in memes or jokes about programming languages, you know, they'll have Python, C, Java, JavaScript. They'll even have like Rust and Go. Um, but for whatever reason, and I take it almost like a, not an insult, but you know, uh, I always think it's an oversight that people are just starting to like eliminate Lisp from the conversation. And there are some practical reasons for that, but um, Lisp is one of the oldest languages and it was just a totally different paradigm. Um, sadly, one of the reasons that you don't hear too much about Lisp anymore is because a lot of languages have kind of pilfered and, um, you know, really stolen some of the best ideas from Lisp. So one example, if you ever use Lambda in your languages, um, that came from Lisp. Um, and some of these things, when you see them in another language, they're not actually as elegant as like the original implementation in Lisp. Like La Lambda and Python's kind of very toyish. Lambda and C++ is just very ugly um, and kind of clunky. So, um, you know, some of these, and it's true for, for most languages, like a lot of the concepts are taken from other languages. So the more languages you learn, the more you'll learn that that some of this is just syntax changing on top of existing like semantics. I think a big turning point for Lisp, other than people that were already kind of hardcore Lisp experts, um, was a book that came out, uh, I believe early 2000s, by Peter Seibel named Practical Common Lisp. But anyway, Practical Common Lisp was really my you know, I remember seeing that book at Borders and buying it. And then the idea of Practical Common Lisp is that it showed you examples of how to use Lisp in similar ways that you would use Python. So in other words, for like practical things that you would do to automate things, there's a um, chapter on like reading MP3 files and creating like an MP3 database. And there's a chapter on like, um, I think a web server. Can't remember all the applications, but it's very practical stuff for the time. Um, I think another breakthrough with Lisp is, was this book um, called Land of Lisp. And by, sorry if I pronounce names wrong, but Conrad Barsky. And this is just an awesome book. If you're watching this, Conrad, I think I bought like two or three copies. That's a great book because it reminded me a lot of the programming books I used to read when I was a teenager in the 1980s. And back then, the language that everybody used or learned first was called BASIC. And um, there was books that you'd get that were basically games written in BASIC. So you would sit there with your, whatever your home computer was at the time, 
you'd stay up till 1 a.m. typing in this program, learning a little bit about programming at the time. Back then, nobody said coding. Um, and then you would, like, at, hopefully everything went okay, and then you'd end up with the game at the end of the night. Um, so that was kind of like one of the spirits of that of Land of Lisp. Um, it's also just showing you straight off the bat how Lisp is um, not as bureaucratic as a language like say Java. So there's not as there's definitely not as much boilerplate as Java. Um, and like I said, I think the spirit of Lisp, a lot of it was, I won't say stolen, but you know, to influence Python. And when you get that um, feeling of kind of iterative prototyping, really fast prototyping in Python, that originally was something that people experienced with Lisp. You know, Python is an amazing language. The creator, um, Guido, or the creators, they are incredibly clear thinking. So a lot of the decisions they made were just, it's amazing how clear thinking they were about choosing the, the least ambiguous like choice for the language. Now, I can't say exactly the same thing for Lisp. Lisp does take practice. Um, you know, one of the kind of superficial complaints about Lisp is like, oh my God, there's like millions of parentheses, like, and even if you mention Lisp to somebody, that's like one of their main memories of it. It's like, you know when you mention math to somebody and they're like, oh, I was terrible at math or something. You know, when you mention Lisp, if somebody encountered it when they were kind of in their college days, they might, they'll, you know, 90% of the time make that comment about parentheses. <laughs>
and you're probably going to have to get it on eBay. And it's called On Lisp, Advanced Techniques for Common Lisp. Um, if you're ever in a thrift store and you see this book there, just grab it. Because um, it's pretty hard to find. I think I, I finally bit the bullet and just ordered a uh, used copy. But this really gets into, like I was saying, the really powerful macro system. So when I say macro system, it's not exactly the same, but you can think about it getting to the level of like meta programming in C++ with templates and some of the other meta programming um, facilities. Um, another kind of aspect why Lisp really isn't as popular as it probably should be is that it was part of some of these earlier AI booms. So, you know, maybe it was just kind of a casualty of people of it being overhyped along with AI during those periods. As well as, um, you know, we've seen examples now, I just keep using Python, but also Java, that now they, these languages come with a ton of, of functionality, you know, like batteries included. And um, it was kind of hard. There was definitely a Tower of Babel situation with Lisp where it started splitting off into all kinds of dialects. You had it standardized with ANSI Common Lisp. I wasn't following Lisp at the time, so I'm not sure how like hardcore Lisp people from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, what they thought of ANSI Common Lisp when it came out. I think also a lot of the kind of, um, when people would say Lisp is the greatest language, it was an earlier time, and so a lot of that comparison was against C, where C is very, you know, you're managing your own memory, um, which is very error prone, of course, but it's also very, like, um, relies on strings a lot, um, and C Lisp was kind of very symbolic from the very beginning. Like an older style of Lisp, you wouldn't worry about representing everything with strings. Like the symbols themselves could be like your answer in your program. So because you're using this language interactively, like I said, way, way before Python. And you might have a function just kind of return the symbols that represent the answer. And now these symbols aren't the strings, like the string answer, they're like the symbols themselves. So it like saves time because you're not encoding everything as strings. There are modern libraries for Common Lisp. It's called Quick Lisp, where it's a system very easy within Lisp itself. You kind of type like install Quick Lisp. It kind of like starts bootstrapping itself, installing things. And then you start um, pulling in libraries. I could go on forever. It's just a super interesting language. And then I th really think people, more people should be playing around with it. And then you will go back to your language and realize, hey, you know what? I think they got this from Lisp. Thank you. Um, like and subscribe if you want to. Thanks.